This particular video is going to look at Schaefer's stages of attachment. And Schaefer came up with the idea that as children get older, their level of attachment and how they attach changes. We're going to look at these four stages and what each of them actually involves. And also how we came about with this theory that there are four stages of attachment. So this is a key study on your specification. So you've got to know this one off by heart. You've got to be able to recall the procedures, you've got to recall the findings as well. So Sean Emerson did an observational study. And the observation was initially done by the parents and then reported to Schaefer and Emerson later. So this is something we're going to pick on later when we do the evaluation. And it's also a longitudinal study. So what a longitudinal study is, is a study that's done over a very long period of time. So we followed the children over a set period. It wasn't just done on one day, it was continuously followed up at set intervals across a period of time. So what they did was they got 60 infants, and they were all from Glasgow. And that's why I've got our little Scottish baby down there in the corner. 60 Glaswegian babies and mothers. And they're aged between 5 weeks and 23 weeks old, so very young babies. And they were observed every 4 weeks until they were 1 years old. And they were also observed again at 18 months. So that's why it's a longitudinal study. We're following them over a period of time. So we've had a look at the procedures, um, how Schaefer and Emerson conducted their study. Now we're going to have a look at the findings and what they actually found about attachment. And they found that most infants maintained one primary attachment figure. So most of the young babies would attach to one person. And that wasn't always the person who fed or bathed them. 39% of children attached to someone else other than the person who fed them. And there was actually little or a little relationship only between the amount of time spent with the child and the attachment formed. What was more important was whether someone could respond to that child's cues. Okay, if you were sensitive and responded to the child when they cried, for example, when they smiled, you were far more likely to form an attachment. Okay, so it wasn't just about spending time with the child, it was about being sensitive to their needs. Um, and within one month of forming that first attachment, 29% of children had many, many more attachments. So Shadra and Emerson clearly thought, once you've got that one attachment, then you can start forming other attachments with other people the father, grandfather, uncles, aunties. So the main findings or conclusions of Schaefer and Emerson study then were that responsiveness is the key. Okay, So those children who were intensely attached or securely attached to a mother had mothers who responded quickly to their demands. And that is what formed the attachment. Once they interacted with the child, that was likely to bring about attachment. An infant who had very weak or no attachments with their mothers had mothers who failed to interact with that child. So you can see responsiveness to a child's needs is the key to forming attachment. It's not just about spending time or feeding or bathing them. It's about responding to their needs. So this table is absolutely vital for your exam. You're going to be asked potentially to mention the stages of attachment and discuss what these stages involve. So it's really important that you understand the four stages, the asocial stage, the indiscriminate attachment, specific attachments and multiple attachments. And as children get older um, in the weeks and months from their initial birth, they start to show these different forms of attachment. So we're going to start here with the a social attachment. And this is those first initial six weeks of a child's life. And what happens in this stage is that they respond to all kinds of stimuli. So whether it's you being sociable or not sociable with them, just looking at them will bring about a favorable reaction. They don't really protest or cry too much at this stage when someone leaves the room, but their behavior towards humans and non-humans is very, very similar. So by that I mean, if I was to look over and smile at a six week old baby, it might smile back. If I was to put a teddy bear that also has a smiley face, the baby's going to respond to that as well. So it responds very similarly to human and non-humans in very, very similar ways. They don't really have one main primary caregiver at the moment. OK, 
Okay, they're not attached to one person. They respond equally to most people. And they'll take cuddles from almost anybody that's around. And as we've learned previously, reciprocity and interactional synchrony are absolutely vital at this stage. The children will be imitating, copying what adults are doing in order to replicate their behaviours and their emotions as well. So the next stage of attachment is indiscriminate attachment. And this is from that six week stage up to seven months. And this is where children start to enjoy human company that little bit more now. So they're choosing humans over non-humans. And they start to get upset when you don't play with them. And from three months onwards, they start to smile at familiar faces. So they'll start to recognize you and they'll start to smile. And they're also easily, more easily comforted by one main caregiver. So this is usually the mother, they'll be easily calmed down by that one person an awful lot easier than anybody else. However, they do accept cuddles from most people still, and they haven't yet started to show separation or stranger anxiety. So separation anxiety is when the mother leaves the room, they show extreme distress. They haven't quite started to show that yet. And stranger anxiety is they become very wary and anxious when strangers are around. And again, they still haven't developed that particular attribute yet. So from seven months to nine months, they start to show specific attachment. And this is when they're attaching to one main person. And in 65% of the time, that is usually the mother. And they look for comfort, protection, security from that one person. And whereas, as we've already learned, it's not the person who spends the most time or feeds them. It's the person who is most sensitive to their needs that they're going to attach to. And also they start to show wariness now of when strangers are around. So they're starting to show stranger anxiety a bit. And finally, from 10 months onwards, they start to show multiple attachments. So they've already developed their one primary caregiver, um, who, like we said, is 65% of the time the mother. But now they start to attach to other people. And by 18 months, they will have an awful lot of attachments. Like we said before, it might be the father, grandmother, aunties, uncles, cousins. And 29% of children usually have that secondary attachment once they develop their primary attachment. So they develop their specific attachment and then they can start developing lots and lots of multiple attachments after that. So like I said, this table is absolutely vital. Make sure you know the four stages, make sure you know when they occur, Make sure you know what happens at each of those stages. So we're now going to have a look at the evaluation of this particular topic. And there's two things you might get asked to evaluate in your actual exam. You might get to ask to evaluate Schaefer and Emerson's actual study. You might get asked to evaluate the four stages. So we're going to have a look at how we do both of those. And we're also going to look at still trying to develop those four ladder points for every evaluation point that we're going to put in our essays or answers. So the first thing we're going to look at is the evaluation of Schaefer and Emerson's actual study. And there's definitely an example bias within it. Um, for two main reasons. Firstly, it was done on a working class population. So the findings might not apply to other social groups. It might not apply to middle class and upper class. In addition, it was only done in Scotland and Glasgow specifically. So therefore, we might not be able to apply those to other populations around the world. It might not apply to Europe, parts of Africa. Um, America. So there are certain sample biases within the study. In addition to that, it might lack temporal validity as well. It was done in the 1960s. And if you think about it, parental attitudes and the way we bring up our children now has changed considerably since that period of time. So therefore, it's probably very unlikely we're going to get similar results if the study was repeated today. Another major issue with Schaefer and Emerson's study is the fact that it was done by self-report of the mothers. So they might have tried to present themselves in a very positive light when recording behaviours. So it may have been that they were less sensitive to their infants protesting or crying, and therefore they didn't record it in their diary. So mothers will always want to try and present themselves in the best possible light. They want to appear to be the best mother they are. So it may be the fact that they didn't recall all the times they were insensitive with their child. And overall, this will challenge the validity of the study. Okay, the internal validity of it will be questioned because we might actually be measuring what we're supposed to be measuring.
because the mothers aren't giving us the full picture. However, on the other hand, there is a positive. It does have good internal validity. Because the behavior that we were observing or was observed by mothers was natural and occurred in the home of the child. Therefore, the child behavior would not have been affected at all by the presence of other people. So although there are issues, there is the strength that it does have good internal validity because it was a natural environment. So their behavior shouldn't have changed very much at all. So we've had a look at the issues with the study itself, but in your exam, they might also, also ask you to evaluate the four stages of attachment as well. So we're going to look at a few little points that you could put in for evaluating stages. So the first idea is that there's a lot of issues with stage theories and trying to explain human behavior in stages that occur in a set order can be very, very difficult. Yes, that human behavior is very inflexible. And as we know, different humans and there's individual differences, which means people develop at different rates. And stages don't always apply. So if you think about it, the stage, the fourth stage of attachment say that you must have your primary attachment figure and then you start to develop multiple attachments after that. However, in certain cultures like India and other collectivist cultures where they're all focused on the group. That doesn't happen. There's often multiple caregiving that goes on for one child. The family is very important and all family members take the chance and opportunity to help bring up that child. So in those sort of cultures like India, children will develop multiple attachments first and that becomes the norm in those particular cultures. And this brings us on to our next point, the fact that there is cultural bias towards Western cultures with this theory. This was created in the West. Schaefer and Emerson were based their study in Scotland. You've got then Bowlby who came up with his idea that we develop one main attachment and then multiple attachments after that. And Bowlby is someone we'll, you will learn an awful lot about a bit later in this course. However, a lot of other studies have found different things. Okay, and Van Eijendorn, who's done an awful lot of cross-cultural studies around the world, is someone you need to know this main study a little bit later on for your course, found that in collectivist cultures like India, because we have this idea of multiple people looking after a child, they develop multiple attachments before single attachments. So it shows that there must be a cultural bias, that maybe this stage theory only applies to Western cultures like the UK, like America, and like Europe. It can't apply to those collectivist cultures like China and India, where they have multiple caregiving. And therefore, the study lacks, or the theory lacks external validity, because we can't generalize the findings to other cultures around the world. But the final issue we're going to have a look at is the idea that it's very difficult and there's a lot of problems in studying infants in the asocial stage. They are very, very young. Any of you that have very young cousins, very young brothers or sisters and can remember babies in those initial six weeks. They have very poor coordination. They are very immobile. They basically can't even move their head. They lie there. They rely on you to pick them up, you to do everything for them. And the issue is that there's not much to observe at that stage at all. So although we come up with the idea of what happens in that asocial stage and that these set things happen, it's very, very difficult to observe anything because they don't do very much at all. And any movements that they do do, we don't really know why they're doing them. And just for a few of you, you'll see them in a few little videos anyway, of the course of this topic. There is my little boy there in the bottom hand corner. I don't put him in all of the videos, but He's in this particular one. 